Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to learn about how we smell. More specifically, we'll look at the purpose of smell and what would happen if we lost our sense of smell. You picked the right co-host for this episode. I'm the most smelltastic guy around. You see, you say that as if I had a choice of co-host, which I clearly don't, as evidenced by the fact that I inexplicably always choose you. It's you and me till the end, friend. Just you and me. You're like a lingering stench that I just can't shake. Smell is one of our more innate senses. It's the first sense we use when we're born. In fact, babies use their sense of smell to identify their mother. They can distinguish between the smell of their mum's breast and another woman's breast and the smell of each of their milk. And they use this to orient themselves. <laughs> it's like babies are booby bloodhounds. Try saying that 10 times quickly. Babies are booby bloodhounds. 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 Bo baby anyway, our sense of smell is also essential for our survival. Like a baby uses smell to locate breast milk, we use smell to locate food and distinguish poisonous from non-poisonous substances. Our ability to smell smoke warns us of fire, and the repulsive smell of feces keeps us safe from harmful bacteria. Smell is so important that 3% of our entire genome is devoted to the receptors that allow us to distinguish one smell from another. Interesting you should say that. 3% of my genome is devoted to making smells for other people to distinguish. Don't be proud of that. As we went over in our How Do We Taste video, smell is an important part of taste. Without smell, we can only roughly tell if a food is sweet, sour, salty, bitter, or umami. The reason for the close link between taste and smell is due to the release of volatile airborne molecules known as odorants from the foods we ingest. The mouth and nasal cavity are connected, allowing these odorants to travel up into the nose and be smelt while we're chewing. Quick question, what's a nose? It's the thing in the middle of your face, or at least it should be there, but somebody didn't bother to give us noses. We got swindled! I want my nose and I want it now! Oh, God, no. What? What happened? Oh, does it look good? Uh, yeah, buddy. Yeah, of, co of course it does. While you've got that nose on you, let's use it to teach the folks at home about how smell actually works. Odorants travel up through your nose, 95% of which exists just to filter dust and irritants from the air. At the top of your nasal cavity, there's a small, specialized area of tissue about the size of a postage stamp known as the olfactory epithelium. It's worth mentioning here that another word for smell is olfaction, so you'll hear that term popping up quite a bit. This little area houses every single unique chemoreceptor designed to bind and distinguish odorants. In humans, the olfactory epithelium has 400 confirmed unique types of olfactory chemoreceptors, which allow us to distinguish at least one trillion unique scents, according to researchers from the Rockefeller University. Am I the only one tired of all this Latin mumbo jumbo? Old factory epihelium. It's, it's nonsense. Why not just call it the smell square? Because that's what we call you gooch. What's a gooch? Another thing they never bothered to give us. And please, please don't ask for one. Trust me. Odorants get trapped in the mucus that covers your olfactory epithelium and breaks down the odorants, which then bind to your olfactory chemoreceptors. If enough odorants bind, then the olfactory chemoreceptor sends a signal up into the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb is kind of like the processing center for your smells. Big bundles of nerve cells called glomeruli accumulate signals from your chemoreceptors. If this signal is strong enough, then another nerve cell called a mitral cell then relays the signal up into the brain thus acknowledging that you are indeed smelling that unique smell. Right, so, so let me get this straight. Let's say I fart. Did you? That's besides the point. My nose is now detecting all the unique scents that make up that fart. Cheese, eggs, ham, Doritos. But each glomeru whatever only receives the signals of a single type of smell. Correct. See, each odorant has its own highly specific structure. <laughs> oh. God, that is awful. That fart is just pure Doritos. Get your bowels checked, Crash. Oh. Anyway, the simplest model of odorant binding suggests that it's kind of like a lock and key. The odorant is the key and the receptor is the lock, both highly specific so that they only fit one another. However, because we only encode for between 400 and 1,000 different olfactory chemoreceptors, but can detect one trillion different scents, we suspect that there's a lot more going on with how these receptors bind odorants. The most recent theory suggests that our receptors detect what frequency the bonds in odorants resonate at, and this, combined with the shape of the molecule, produces a highly specific smell. If this is true, our receptors are actually using quantum physics to smell. It's like a whole other universe in my nose. 
Now to go where no man has gone before. Ew. What's fun about this is that not everyone's genes are exactly the same. For example, you know the phenomenon known as asparagus pee? I've never eaten a vegetable in my life. But I do read Reddit. Go on. Well, that smell comes from asparagusic acid, a sulfur-containing compound that gets metabolized into another compound called methanethiol and released in your pee. Thing is, though, not everyone can smell it. A study in 2016 from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health found that roughly half the population are unable to perceive the smell of asparagus pee at all. And here's another one. Guys produce a testosterone-like compound called androstenone, which can either smell like nothing at all, a delicate vanilla scent, or, the worst of all, sweat and urine. In other mammals, androstenone is a pheromone that signals sexual behavior. When female pigs pick up on the androstenone produced by male pigs, they, uh, well... They get ready for a porkin. Nicely put. Point is, if humans use androstenone in a similar way, then does that mean some people get sexually aroused by other people's sweat? What about the majority of us who can't smell androstenone at all? I did order this pheromone spray online, which is guaranteed to help me attract the ladies. Crash, you know that all that pheromone spray stuff is just hokum, right? No, 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 listen, listen to the description. Just one spray of fur love is all it takes to drive women crazy. <laughs> Drive woman crazy? This guy can't even speak English properly. Oh, so if you can't speak English properly, then you're dumb? Wow, culture. Never would have picked you as being so close-minded. Look, I'm just saying that there's no real science supporting this pheromone stuff. In other animals that use pheromones, they have a unique organ called the vomeronasal organ. It's a little bit like the olfactory system we've described so far, but it's usually used for detecting odorants in a liquid form. In humans, though, this vomeronasal organ disappears during development of the embryo, and instead, we're just left with a cavity where it should be. You kidding me? I sell out $100 for this pheromone crap! Why didn't you just invest that $100 into, oh, I don't know, deodorant? Or soap? Or hot water? Culture, if a judge can't convince me to take a shower, then you have no hope! Well, the good news is that we might have pheromones, we just haven't necessarily discovered them yet. It's possible to have pheromone interactions without a vomeronasal organ. Alternatively, it's also possible that we just have smells that act in the same way as pheromones. In animals, pheromones aren't just used for sexual attraction. They can indicate aggression, warning, signal territory, or form parental bonds. It's highly possible that we have smells that still perform these functions. For example, a famous 1994 experiment by Swiss zoologist Klaus Wiedekind showed that women may have an attraction to men with different immune systems from themselves. Klaus got a group of men to wear t-shirts over two nights and then took the t-shirts and placed them in covered boxes. He then had women come in and sniff the t-shirts before describing their intensity and attractiveness. Klaus showed that the women had a preference for men with different immune genes than their own, a conclusion that makes sense, considering that offspring would be more resilient to disease. Klaus also managed to satisfy his own urges. Good for him. Putting government-issued research money into realizing his dirty, dirty fetish. I can only hope that I can use government-issued money for such a thing. One day. Maybe. Oh, his fetish is serious business. Perfume companies make their money off the fact that smell is so closely linked to our emotions and our memories. This is because, unlike sight or sound, smell doesn't get routed through more conscious parts of your brain. Instead, it ties in directly to the limbic system. The limbic system is the part of your brain that's involved in your emotions, your memories, and your more primal physiology. That includes the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the hypothalamus, respectively. It's not until the orbital prefrontal cortex that the active role of distinguishing smells comes into play. Think about how the smell of cooking food can completely distract you from what you are doing and just make you want to eat. Or how the smell of pine trees can transport you back to your days in primary school. Essentially, smell bypasses all that intellectual stuff and cuts right through to your animal instincts. Just like me! That's right, baby. Breathe me. I think I need a gas mask. Smell is incredibly powerful, and it's undervalued way too often. In a healthy person, olfactory neurons are replenished every four to eight weeks. That's the speediest regeneration of any neuron in our bodies. But certain conditions can lead to a lack of sensitivity of these receptors and a subsequent loss of smell, known as anosmia. Temporary anosmia happens all the time. Think about the last time you had a bad cold or the flu. In these cases, the olfactory epithelium gets inflamed and loses its sensitivity. Unfortunately, there are many more ways to lose your sense of smell. Head injuries can damage the nerves required to transmit information about smell from the olfactory bulb to the brain. 
Of course, as with any other sense, you also lose your sense of smell in old age. Toxic chemicals can also destroy your olfactory chemoreceptors. And of course there's quite a few Wall Street bankers who don't smell as well as they used to. If you catch my drift. True. Interestingly though, you can also be anosmic to specific compounds. Remember how I said that there were 400 confirmed types of olfactory chemoreceptor? Well, there's actually a thousand olfactory genes, but 600 of them are only pseudogenes, meaning that they no longer actively encode for receptors. Thing is, which genes work and which genes don't are very different from person to person. There are certain smells that you can detect that your friend can't, and vice versa. People always like to chat about whether we all see the same colors, but how crazy is it that we don't even smell the same scents? Not that crazy. I lived without knowing this and very little will change now that I do. I don't think you get a crash. Smell is powerful. Smell can accentuate or diminish an emotion. Smell can call back a memory in an instant. Smell can stop our minds in their tracks. The number of smells you have in your smell arsenal is incredibly important. Please don't say smell arsenal again. Yeah, that's a fair point. All I'm saying is, appreciate your sense of smell. You rely on it a lot more than you think. Okay, got it. Now, can you get rid of this nose for me? Sounds good. You grab the scissors and I'll grab the towel. Wait, what? See you all soon.